All the surrounding area then had been captured, and the Tyrians alone were defying the Egyptians and remained well disposed and loyal to Persia. Irritated by this, the Egyptian king summoned his council. That was the first time he called Chariots into his circle of advisors. He made the following speech. My allies, for I am not going to call my friends slaves. You see the problem. We are like a ship that has had fair sailing for a long time and is now caught in an adverse wind. Tire, impregnable tire, is holding back our swift advance. And we hear, too, that the king is hard upon us. So what should we do? We cannot take Tyre, nor can we pass it by. It is like a wall that stands in our way, shutting us out of the whole of Asia. My view is that we should get away as soon as we can, before the Persian forces join the Tyrians. It would be dangerous for us to be caught in enemy territory. Pelusium, on the other hand, is secure. There we need not fear attack from Tyrians or Medes or the whole world. The desert is impassable, the entrance is narrow, the sea is ours, and the Nile is the Egyptians' friend. At this overcautious speech, all fell silent and were downcast. Charius was the only one with enough spirit to say anything. Your majesty, he said, for it is with you that true majesty lies, not with the Persian, who is the vilest of human beings. I am sorry you are considering retreat at a time when we should be celebrating victory, for we are on the road to victory, if the gods so will. And it is not just Tyre we are going to capture, but Babylon itself. Many obstacles arise in a war. We should not shrink from them, but come to grips with them, with good hope as a constant shield. These Tyrians who are now laughing us to scorn, I shall set them before you naked and in chains. If you do not believe me, then leave, but sacrifice me first, for I shall share not your retreat while I live. But if you insist on going, leave a few volunteers with me. I and Polycharmus will fight, for it is a god's behest that we have come. They were all too ashamed not to accept Charius's proposal. The king applauded his spirit and granted him permission to select as large a force as he wanted. He did not make his choice immediately, but went about among the troops encamped there telling Polycharmus to do the same, and began first to search out any Greeks in the camp. There were a number to be found, serving as mercenaries. He picked out Spartans, Corinthians, and men from the Peloponnese generally, and also found a score or so of Sicilians. When he had formed a group of 300, he addressed them as follows. Greeks, the king gave me the chance to pick the best men in the army I have picked you, I am Greek myself, from Syracuse, Dorian by race. We must surpass the others in courage as well as in noble origin. Now, no one should panic at the operation I am asking you to undertake. We shall find it feasible and easy. It looks more difficult than it will prove to be. The same number of Greeks resisted Xerxes at Thermopylae. There are not five million Tyrians. There are only a few of them. They are disdainful and arrogant, not spirited and sensible. Well, they shall find out how superior Greeks are to Phoenicians. I have no passionate desire to be your leader. I will follow anyone among you who wants to be in command. He will find me obedient. It is not my fame, but that of us all that fires my ambition. They all cried out, You be our general. You want me to make you you want me to be your leader. I will, he said. You have given me the command, so I shall do all I can to ensure that you do not regret showing this goodwill to me and this trust in me. Rather, with the help of the gods, you shall become famous and celebrated in our own time, 
as well as the richest of allies. And for the future, you shall leave behind you an undying reputation for courage. Everyone will sing your praises, as they do with Orthridides' 300 men, or those of Leonidas. So they will with Chariots' band. Before he had finished speaking, they all cried out, Be our leader! And they all ran for their weapons. Charius equipped them with the best of arms and armor, and led them to the king's tent. The Egyptian was surprised to see them. He thought it was not his familiar troops, but some others that he was looking at, and he promised them great rewards. We are sure of that, said Charius, but keep the rest of your troops in arms, and do not move on Tyre until we have it in our power, and climb up on the walls and call you in. May the gods bring that to pass, said the king. Charius drew his men up in close order and led them against Tyre. They looked far fewer than they were. In fact, it was really a case of shield pressed against shield, helmet against helmet, man against man. At first, they were not even seen by the enemy. But when they were close, the men on the wall caught sight of them and signaled to those inside. The last thing they expected was that there were hostile troops. Who would have ever thought that so small a force would approach an extremely powerful city to attack it? A city not even the whole Egyptian army had ever dared to attack. When they came close to the walls, the Tyrians wanted to know who they were and what they wanted. Charis replied, We are Greek mercenaries. We are not getting our pay from the Egyptians. In fact, they are plotting to kill us, so we have come to join you, so as to get our revenge on our common enemy. This information was passed on to those inside. The gates were opened, and the garrison commander came out with a handful of men. Charius killed him first, and rushed at the others, and smote them about him on every side, and a hideous groaning rose from them. Others slew others, like lions falling on an unguarded herd of cattle, and the whole city was in the grip of wailing and lamentation, as few could see what was happening, and everyone was in a panic. A disordered mass of people poured out of the gate to see what had happened. The, that, more than anything else, was what brought about the destruction of the Tyrians, for those inside kept trying to force their way out, while the people outside, being struck and stabbed by swords and spears, tried to escape back inside. They collided with each other in a combined space, and this gave their slaughterers an excellent opportunity. It was not even possible to close the gates, because the entry was piled high with corpses. In this indescribable confusion, Chirius was the only one who kept his head. He forced his way through those in his path, got inside the gates, leapt up onto the walls with nine others, and from up there signaled to the Egyptians to come. They arrived at lightning speed and Tyre was captured. Its capture was the first signal for general festivity. Chiris alone neither offered sacrifice nor put a garland on his head. What use is it to me to celebrate victory if you are not there to watch, Calerho? I will never wear a garland again after our wedding night. If you are dead, it is sacrilege. And even if you are alive, how can I be festive if I am separated from you? Well, that was the situation they were in. As for the Persian king, he had crossed the Euphrates and was hurrying as fast as he could to get to grips with the enemy. For when he heard that Tyre had been captured, he was afraid for Sidon and the whole of Syria, since he could see that the enemy which were now a match for him. He decided, for this reason, not to take all his train along with him on the march anymore, but to travel light, so that nothing would impede his rapidity of movement. He took with him the best of his army, and left behind the age group unsuited for service, along with the queen, his possessions, his clothing, and the royal treasure. Since everything was a mass of confusion and disorder, and since cities as far as the Euphrates were in the grip of war, he thought it would be safer
to put the people who were being left behind on Aradas for security. 